So welcome everybody to our um, NGTS seminar today. This is the second seminar that is also part of TFTC webinars here. Today we are proud and pleased to have Dr. Alistair Loder here presenting to us their latest research on network inefficiency and their empirical findings for six European cities. Dr. Loder is a postdoctoral research scholar at TUM uh, in Munich, Germany, in the civil, uh, in the traffic in injury and control chair. And he was a, mm, he got his PhD from ETH Zurich in 2019 and a master's degree in energy science and technology from ETH as well. So, as I said, let's say thank you so much for being with us today. And the floor is all yours. Thank you very much uh, for the kind introduction. Um, yes, yeah, so today I would like to present to you a uh, research uh, Lisa Hamm, Gabriel Tilg, and I, under the supervision of Monica and uh, Klaus Bogenberger, uh, conducted last year and we presented uh, this year at TRB. And you already mentioned the title of the presentation. Uh, we would like to talk about something we define as network efficiency, but I will talk you through that, what we mean by that. So here you see nice pictures of us, uh, of the entire team. And um, so the paper that is uh, underlying this presentation has already been published at TRR. So I think it takes a couple of weeks and then you can um, find it online. If you're interested to find it earlier, you can write us an email and we can send it to you or you somehow try to access this link. I don't know if it's possible via Zoom, but maybe Gabriel can, can post the link into the chat here and then you can have a look at it. So after almost two years of whatever, um, we were finally lucky again, and uh, we have been able to travel. And uh, here you see Lisa, the main author of the paper presenting the poster. And it was very, very nice to be back although it was still somehow special to be at the somewhat, somewhat empty convention center, but uh, at least we have been able to meet a couple of familiar faces and uh, engage into some sort of exchange, be it personal or academic uh, discussions and conversations. It was very, very good. And I hope that we can uh, continue from that and uh, leave the mess that we encountered behind. Okay, so the um, agenda for this presentation is uh, pretty straightforward. So first of all, I would like to introduce you the idea that we had last year, then I will talk you through the methodology that we used, the data that we used, um, show you some of the results and then uh, the next steps. So when we talk about network inefficiency, we, we refer to it as the somewhat um, the de degree of that we lost something. So we have an, a network available that we can use for producing trips or travel, as we say in, in traffic flow theory. And um, usually we do not use it to 100%. So we will lose something out of the available capacity. And you can imagine several different kinds of reasons why we are not able to the full capacity that is provided. So I think one of the foremost is that we have always the assumption that this fundamental diagram, also the macroscopic fundamental diagram, somewhat shows our stationary uh, traffic states, but usually traffic is not stationary, it's always dynamic. Then in addition in a network, we rarely have a very homogeneous distribution of vehicles in the network. So some roads might be occupied with a lot of vehicles where others are not. And in addition, we also have a different kind of different types of vehicles rolling around in the network. And we also have some sort of traffic control acting on the distribution of vehicles and the control of vehicle flow that also interferes for, for example, give public transport priority or give priority to active mobility that is also interfering with the um, perfect or optimal network use. So we have an upper limit of what we can produce, but we have always realize less. And the difference is what we define as network inefficiency. And in this study, we were interested in understanding, um, or first of all, trying to quantify it, and then secondly, trying to model it and explain it. 
So I was already mentioning some of the, the ideas that are underlying why we are having or why we're experiencing network inefficiency. And the, one of the main causes is that we have a very complex dynamic system, which with the network loading, the network unloading, the network collapse, and the diff different kind of origin and destination streams that are overlapping and interacting. So it's a very, very complex system that is barely able to use the network that is available at its full capacity. In addition, we always have in an urban environment interactions between different kinds of vehicles or pedestrians or travelers. And all of these conflicts have to be negotiated. For example, at a, here you see a traffic uh, intersection where also other people have um, priority, to, as I mentioned, was mentioning priority to, to pass the road and maybe they get extended green times. And so the traffic streams are always obstructed, uh, are obstructed again. And I already mentioned the impact of uh, signal control. So we have, for example, a parameter control can have public transport priority in a city that tries to uh, speed up public transport. We can have a parameter control system active or a gating system active in the city that tries to limit uh, the amount of vehicles in the network to a certain number. And um, so we could maybe add more vehicles to the network, but the control strategy doesn't allow more vehicles to enter. So this could also be a reason of why the network is not fully used, but there are others, objectives in mind that try to avoid this. So we see where well, we have a lot of courses why we have somewhat inefficient use or we have inefficiency in the network use and how can we measure it? How can we quantify it and make it comparable across networks? And for this, we use the concept of the MFD, but I will uh, introduce it later on um, for those of you who don't know what it is. So we try to work, or we want to work on networks. So as, we went, as the coin, as the term basically explains, is about the network inefficiency. So there we have the travel times while driving and also the travel times while standing. So that the queue at intersection and the waiting at intersection and the driving time are put together in this inefficiency measure. And what we do here, we have the MFD, we try to derive its upper bound, which we call the, uh, the idealized MFD or the upper MFD. Then we have the observed MFD, which should by definition always be below the upper MFD. And the express or the excess delays are simply the difference between the upper MFD and the observed MFD. And the benefit of this perspective is that when we ex express the delays that a vehicle has in terms of the regular delay that is expressed in the MFD and the excess delays, we can compare the excess delays across networks because the inherent delays that are captured in the MFD are basically subtracted from the measured MFDs, uh, from the measured travel times. So in the end, the excess delays, as we call it, or is, is a measure of the network inefficiency, and it is measuring the additional effects that cause delays. So it's not only a measure, it's not a measure of the actual observed MF, uh, delay, but of the additional delay that is experienced by drivers in the network. And as I was introducing earlier, it's a combination of, um, of these additional delays result from uh, the network loading from a multimodal vehicle interactions, from signal control settings, but also from the distribution of vehicles in the network. And for example, and of course, other sources could be there as well. And the rationale of this study was that we had the idea and we were wanted to explore them. So can we basically measure it? Can we quantify it? And can we somehow put what we find when we use empirical data to what we have in terms of hypotheses and is there something to explore and, and then in the next research steps, explore even further. And in our study, we are using different kinds of data sources with different kinds of characteristics in order to see how not only cities compare, but also how data sources compare when, and when we try to estimate the additional delays. So let's start with the macroscopic fundamental diagram or in short, the MFD. It is a relationship between the number of cars in a network and an urban road network with streets and intersections with signals and the average production of travel 
vehicle flow or in other terms, and, but also you can also express this in the relationship between speed and the accumulation of vehicles. And this kind of MFD is usually expressed for rather compact, uh, what we call neighborhoods in an urban road network, which typically uh, have a size of five to 10 square kilometers. And you can use this MFD for a wide range of applications, right? starting from traffic control, as I was uh, mentioning earlier, the gating or perimeter control uses the MFD to control the traffic flow to an optimal but critical point. You can use it for planning purposes. For example, there are a lot of studies that use the MFD for the allocation of bus lanes and road space. You can also use this for road pricing studies and also for traffic pattern analysis. If you want. And the MFD always has this concave relationship between flow and density. And all of the MFDs you will see later are somehow in this similar shape. But as we have shown in another paper is, and also what the Nicolas Givaliminis and Carlos Saganza showed is that, and many other scholars as well, is that there is a link between the network topology and the shape of this MFD. So I was mentioning that there is some sort of upper MFD and then the observed MFD, and that this observed MFD quantifies the losses or the inefficiency that we, that we have. In other words, it's a scatter that we find when we plot the data. And you'll see here an example from traffic data, um, or we are using traffic data from Lucerne and Zurich and Switzerland. And you'll see that there is a clear upper bound in this data, so there's a crisp upper curve, but then below there, there's a lots of, lots of scatter um, which indicates that there's a lot of things are going on that are not stationary, not perfect. And we are interested in quantifying the gap and explaining the gap. And so again, the causes that we, that we are interested in that we want to study is um, in our study here is that we focus on the network and loading processes and the also, and then in the next steps, the hysteresis. Uh, we were interested in understanding the multi model vehicle interactions, and we were also interested in traffic signal control. I was also mentioning the distribution of vehicles in the network as a cause for network inefficiency, but I would dare to say that this problem has already been solved, as we now have uh, algorithms available for network partitioning that try to cut the network into parses and pieces so that the issue of uh, inhomogeneous distribution of vehicles is not present in the MFD anymore, or at least the, the error, the, the bias is, is minimized. So for the network loading, we know that when we start in the morning with a very empty network and we load the network with vehicles, then we have basically started at an empty table and everything is fresh and undisturbed. And if you are living in a city like Chicago or Munich, where nobody in the city itself has a car, but everyone who's living outside has a car and they are driving to the city center, the streets are empty and clean. And then the more people you pour into the city, the more chaos you get. And then in the afternoon, when you try it, or after the peak is reached and you unload the network again, then this change in, in demand pattern with the existing other flows are somehow obstructing each other and other causes of course are there uh, too. But we always, or in many cases, find this hysteresis pattern as the network collapses and the unloading is always, or in many cases, less efficient than the loading process. Then we always know that if you have a larger bus and a smaller car, then the, the bus usually uh, takes up more space than a car. So we can pr produce less travel in terms of vehicle kilometers, but that the bus can carry more people. So we are in theory able to carry more people. So we have this effect of interaction between different kinds of vehicle types as well that influence the network loading and influence network inefficiency. And then we also know that the, the way, as I was mentioning again, the way traffic signal control acts on the MFT uh, or in, on the traffic performance in urban can also be um, shown in many, many different uh, instances. When you see here some examples from a paper of uh, uh, Daganso and Lehe, where, where you basically see how different an MFD can look like depending on how your signals are set. 
So to sum up all of this in a very theoretical slide now, what is the network inefficiency as we understand it in this paper? So we have this desired MFD, which is the upper curve you see on the left-hand side in the gray and on the right-hand side in the, the orange color. And this is the upper curve. So we usually never observe any traffic states above this curve, but we observe traffic states below that curve. And the gap is what we define as the inefficiency. And what we uh, usually do is when we try to, to come up with this MFD is that we have the observed traffic state as you see on the left and the right-hand side. We use a method that we uh, call the resampling of the macroscopic fundamental diagram to get a better approximation of the upper bound, estimate the desired speed curve into this relationship, and then quantify the additional delay as the uh, difference in the desired speed and the observed speed. So here again, to give you, uh, to, to repeat this exercise and to show you a little bit more the steps in detail. So first of all, we have the raw data available. We use the resampling method, uh, where the idea is we, for example, have 100 detectors in the network and we resample thousands of times a subset of these detectors and estimate the MFT. And we do this, for example, like a 30% subsample or 40% subsample. We do the sampling many, many, many times in order to estimate the uh, upper MFD. And you see here on the right-hand side, the, the light gray uh, boxes of the honeycomb here is uh, resulting from the resampling approach. And you see a very, very sharp and crisp border between the observable traffic states and the unobserved traffic states uh, in the resampling plane. Then when we have this resampled MFD, we then can start to estimate what we define as the um, Oh, sorry, say again. Uh, sorry, we can estimate the observed speed and the observed MFT, which is the, the black area. And then we can uh, estimate also in the resample MFT the desired speed curve. So if we say we have 50 vehicles in the network, or 1,000 vehicles in the network, if they are behaving in the optimal way, they, they would drive at that desired optimal speed. But we always observe less. So the difference between the desired optimum and the observed is the excess delay, as we say. And this is always, you can imagine this distance between uh, the upper bound and the, uh, and the observed uh, data points. So when we started to, to do this exercise, we then immediately were uh, confronted with a problem that when we have our nice resample MFD with the crisp upper bound, we somehow need to quantify it or, or model it. And in order to calculate or make an estimation of the desired speed. And in the end, we used three different approaches here. So the first of all, uh, the first approach was that we use a functional form for the MFD, which is a rather uh, econometric approach to it. And we have a paper on this in, in part B published two years ago. Um, where it is a very flexible form to account for very, very different kind of shapes of the MFD. And we use this MFD, uh, this functional form, to estimate in the upper bound the speed relationship. Then the second approach that we used was to cut the entire resample MFD into a set of uh, density bins and use the 99th percentile of the speed distribution in each of these bins as a proxy for the desired speed. And the third relationship was um, is the Underwood uh, equation for the fundamental diagram, what we use, which is an um, exponential um, function for the uh, fundamental diagram. So then now let's talk about uh, the data that we use. So we use in our study empirical data uh, from five cities and one simulated data set. Uh, as I was mentioning earlier, first of all, we were interested in trying to compare how different cities behave, but also how different kind of data sets, uh, you know, how different data sets compare and behave. And also um, to study how different measurement types of technologies or principles or philosophies um, behave. So the first data set, um, and this is maybe one of the most famous ones in recent years, is the, the Pinoima data set from Athens, 
where we have a drone data set uh, hovering around the city center of Athens for 20 hours or so, and they observe all vehicle movements in an area of, I think, almost around two square kilometers. And so we have a very, very, very good observed ground truth data set. And we also have the vehicle type attached to it. So it's very, very good for uh, scrutinizing the effects of multimodal transportation on um, network inefficiency. The second type of data source that we were using uh, is loop detector data. So the most common source uh, at the moment for traffic set estimation and on highways, but also on, on urban road networks. And we use tier data from uh, our UTD data set um, that we published two years ago. Um, for we have data from various cities and we selected a couple of cities where we are confident with the data, but also where we have large amounts of data. So we are able to do a longitudinal study if we're interested in. Also, we have different kind of measurement uh, principles. So we include here uh, London, Paris, uh, Zurich, and Lucerne. And um, London has a scoot system, so where the detectors are placed quite in the beginning of the link. In Zurich and Lucerne, you have many detectors placed right in front of the traffic signal. In Paris, you have a system right in the middle of the link. And then in addition, you have rather long observation periods in Paris of one hour, and then five minutes in uh, the other three cities. And in our analysis here, we did not really subset the data set that we have to um, smaller networks. So we have Zurich, which is in the middle. We have Lucerne, which is slightly smaller. We have uh, Paris, and then we have the huge area of London to also cover, uh, cover the scale of the city. And last but not least, um, the last data set that we used is a simulated data set from Innsbruck, which is a small city in Austria. And um, we use this to study the impact of signal settings because we have the signal settings in the control. And we also observe a ground truth data set here, but it's primarily for uh, car transportation, so vehicle traffic only, uh, car traffic only. So here you basically see, oh, there's a question. Huh. Thank you, Gabriel. So here you see a summary of uh, the data that we use. Um, again, it's just uh, the recap um, of what we discussed. So we have different kind of city sizes, different kind of spatial scales, temporal scales of the solution, data technology, and um, observation interval. So, and now I'm um, trying to get to through the results. As we have many data sets, I will now show you a lot of uh, and many, many plots of different kind of cities that show somewhat the same, but also slightly different uh, things. And I try to point out to the most interesting findings. So here you see uh, the resampled MFD in gray points from the data that we used in Athens. And then also the three different kind of approaches to estimate the desired speed curve. And you already see here that this method to estimate the desired speed curves is quite successful in modeling the upper bound, but you also see that they are somehow different. So um, one might be better to capture the characteristics of this curve in one city while another curve might be better in another city. But nevertheless, it is describing the upper bound and we can continue with this approach um, to model the desired speed. Here you again see the, the three cities of the analysis um, on the left hand side, you see the observed MFD and the resampled MFDs. And in all of the cases, you again find that there is a very, very crisp boundary between the observed traffic states and the unobserved traffic state, really, really supporting the idea of that there is an upper MFD in the network. And on the right hand side, again, you find uh, the resampled MFD and the fitted uh, desired speed curve to it. And here um, you see uh, the other three data sets that we have. And um, you see larger variation in Lucerne and uh, Zurich compared to the other data sets of um, Paris and London in the resampled MFD. And you can argue here, these cities are smaller. So when we have some sort of special event taking place in the city or some variation in the demand distribution, 
it has a bigger, bigger effect on the kind of distribute of the observed NFT compared to the larger city as there is really, really difficult to have a complete different traffic pattern observed in the entire size of the city. And again, on the right hand side, you see that there is again a crisp upper bound between the observed traffic states and the unobserved traffic states. And again, we were able to fit a very nice desired speed curve. So the first, first thing we were interested in is then to see if we, or we, we had the hypothesis is that when we have more vehicles in the network, or the, the loading that we have an increase in the access delays just because more vehicles could mean more conflicts between vehicles. So we have more interactions and more access delays, but also other types of uh, the higher density of vehicles could be a proxy for other kinds of services as well. So our hypothesis was, or initial hypothesis was that we could observe a positive effect of the vehicle density on the access delays which means the more vehicles we have, the more excess delays we observe. And here in Athens, for example, we were not really finding something like this. It's not a very convincing relationship, but in Innsbruck, we were able to find such a relationship. In the Lucerne data, we were able to find such a relationship. And also in the Zurich data, we were able to find such a relationship. Um, in the other data sets, we were not really able to find um, the relationship. Maybe the cities were too large, Maybe the temporal aggregation, for example, in Paris was too, too large uh, with one hour to basically observe the effects or able to quantify the effects. We then tried to use a regression model to um, use the statistics to reveal whether there is a significant effect or not. And here in all the cities, except for Paris, uh, we were at least able to quantify a positive effect of the vehicle density on the excess delays. So there could be something that more density, the more conflicts we have in the network, that trees increase more excess delays. Then we know that we have sometimes the effects of the uh, hysteresis taking place in the network. So we would expect that in the loading phase of the network, we have lower excess delays compared to the unloading of the network. So we were estimating in this regression model of the excess delays as a function of density and the domain of the network loading, this uh, network loading effect, and we, we found that uh, with the exemption of London and Paris, we found that there is in the loading phase of the network less excess delays compared to the unloading of the network. So there's a question. So good question here. Let's go back to the slide. 30. 31. So he was asking why there are some points above the desired speed curve. So the desired speed curve is here fit with econometric tools. And so we, well, of course you can try to fit an under, uh, upper envelope curve to the set of points that we have and somehow have them in a very, very complex shape that is not really suitable for, for modeling. So we decided to use the um, what is called uh, a quintile regression. So we tell the computer, please execute this regression fitting only to a certain percentile of the observed data. And uh, I have to look it up again in the paper, but I think we used the 95th percentile as a cutoff point, and then we fit the desired speed curve into this range. And the motivation is clear. The, the more data we have, we are able to get a more and a better estimate, a more robust and better estimate of the desired speed curve. But please recall that these points that you find here above the desired speed curve are resulting from the resample NFT. So it's something usually you don't observe as a traffic state because all the observed traffic states, as you see on the left hand side, are always way below this upper upper bound. So maybe, maybe to then recap uh, the findings here, which I think uh, are quite interesting because it, it quantifies what we've already seen with a very, very nice and new framework. So we've seen here with the data of the network loading process 
that the more uh, it looks that there is something uh, out there in the data that the more vehicles we have in the network, um, we have more access delays in the network. But, but you, I would suggest that we see the amount of vehicles in the network here as a proxy for a general state of the network loading. So we have more pedestrians, more bicycles, maybe something else in the network that is also affecting the traffic here, um, which we do not observe. So this is a, maybe an indicator variable, a proxy or instrument variable for things we do not observe. But the point here is that the network loading effect for the cities where we have a small network, where we are quite confident with the data, really, really shows that in the loading process, we have a lower uh, access delays compared to the unloading process. So using this kind of access delay framework allows us to somehow quantify and model uh, the hysteresis that we observe in an MFD in a functional relationship. So why do we get some odd estimates here for other cities? Um, so for the Paris data, for example, um, we have a very, very rough or very, very, yeah, as I say, rough time period for the observation of one hour. So we lose a lot of uh, information of the traffic dynamics in this aggregation of one hour. So when we talk about the dynamics, it might be not the best case to use such a um, observation period of one hour. In the London case, it is also that we really have a very large area in our data set, so which spans all of, or I think most of Greater London area of, of all the, I think 33 boroughs of the Greater London area. So it's not really, it's not quite easy to say that there's a general loading trend in the entire network because the network is, or could be faced with different kind of loading patterns at different kind of areas at the same time. Okay, so the takeaway message from this slide is that we are able to quantify the hysteresis or modeling the hysteresis with this excess delay model, and we're able to quantify it. And given that the estimates here between cities are somewhat in, this, in a very similar regime, or effect size here, we are somewhat able to try at least can dare to generalize a little bit and uh, try to transfer these findings to other networks as well. Um, maybe another thought here, the excess delays are somewhat normalized between cities because we subtracted them from the observed MFD, which we usually consider as to be a network feature. So, this could be a rather uh, motivation for use the, using this excess delay and compare the estimates because the, the general trend of the delay structure is uh, expressed in the MFD and the MFD is subtracted from the numbers you find here. So we then used the uh, data from Athens and made a deep, deep dive into how the access delays that we observe in the MFD are somewhat related to the composition of vehicle types in the data set. And we see here in the first picture that we have an increase in excess delays when we have a larger shares of taxi in the network. And you could argue here that taxis, they need to stop a little bit more often than cars just because they need to drop off and pick up passengers. So maybe this one to two stops more for, I don't know, five to 10 kilometers increases uh, the excess delays a little bit. So causes slightly more disturbance that increases the excess delays. We also find a positive relationship um, between uh, the, the share of large vehicles and networks, so, so lorries and trucks, and the excess delays. Uh, interestingly, we find a negative relationship um, with the shares of buses in the network, but on the other hand, compared to the variation we have with the uh, taxi share, you see, and also with the large vehicles there, you see that the variation is slightly narrower just because buses are expected to run on somewhat like a schedule. So we do not have substantial experimental variation here in Athens at all. And we also find a positive relationship with the share of motorcycles in the data set. Um, where you could argue maybe the motorcycles are able to sneak through and the cars have to drive a little bit more carefully. And so 
this again slows down um, traffic and leads to more access delays. But the downside of the Athens data set is that we only observe a very, very narrow picture of the peak hour in a very, very tiny packed area of the city. So expressed here in the, in the problem or the issue with the bus share, which is counterintuitive, um, having data from a longer period of time would maybe allow us to make a better estimate of the model model effects, just because most of the data set that we have here is repeated from day to day, the same time period that it was observed in the same area. So adding more variation to the experimental design maybe would get us more insights into how multimodal traffic interacts with the access delays. So the last um, feature that we were interested in uh, in this exploratory study was the impact of uh, traffic control. And we used the simulation and we slightly uh, changed the, uh, the cycle times and tried to, to see how the development of um, the access delays change uh, with respect to um, the signal times. And you see here that in the loading phase of the network, the, the curves of the points are somewhat close to each other. So it's very, very hard to argue that there is something going on or there is some difference. Maybe using a larger data set, uh, may, maybe using another kind of simulation, a better experimental design might be able to reveal more differences between that. But the interesting finding here is that in the unloading phase, so when we reach the peak of the network loading and then we try to reorganize this chaos on the road network, we see substantial differences in the um, development of access delays as a function of cycle times. And if you watch carefully here, you see that there's a not, not a linear relationship here. So you see the blue line is 60 seconds and the red line is 120 seconds and then 90 seconds. So there is a very, very unlinear or nonlinear uh, effect taking place, which means is that when we so network loading means we are going from a high density to a uh, lower density. So we're going from this 0 uh, 0.025 to 0 0.01 in terms of density. And um, there is uh, the same density level. Um, basically, we achieve different kind of um, outcomes in terms of network inefficiency. And the picture here is not quite clear, so we really need to do more careful uh, analysis of how can we explain this behavior and even try to make proposals for cities how to improve uh, the network use in terms of traffic control. Um, so now let me uh, sum up the presentation and um, what I talked to you as, and what I presented so far. So. The takeaway message here is that we introduced with our paper the idea of access delays. And as the name says, it's the delays that are access to the delays that are present or already formulated or expressed in the MFD. So they are coming on top of that, what is already happening or defined by the rules of physics um, as expressed in the MFD. In our study, we use different kind of data sets to from different cities with different data, data collection tools to somewhat understand how the access delays look like, how they can be calculated, how they can be expressed, and um, how we basically deal with them and try to explain the variation. The interesting part is now that given that we found a lot of uh, significant estimates in the very simple regression model, we can now use in our dynamic models for the MFD or in, on all the MFD models, the equation for the MFD and can augment it with another equation that somehow quantifies these additional losses uh, as a function, for example, of the network loading or as a function of the um, composition of vehicle types and somewhat make the number that we plug into the application where the MFD is used for to a better and more realistic value. And the outlook for this is, as I was mentioning earlier, this was now just a very explorative research. So 
there is no, it's just showing you data and trying to try to explain what we've seen and what we've found. So the next steps is really trying to make a more methodological sound uh, formulation of the entire framework. And I'm very, very curious to understand the role of network topology. So although the network topology is already present in the MFT, we still have the hypothesis that the way the network is organized and structured also has an impact of how the access delays evolve over time. And also, we need a better picture of how the network dynamics, network loading, interest interacting with traffic signal control, for which we need to use a very, very large experimental design of uh, traffic simulations in order to understand to a better extent what we have uh, observing and finding in the data. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. Um, as again, as I, when you have questions, please approach us. We are happy to share the paper with you. Um, I can again promote the data set that we are using here. So most of them are, I think with the exception of Gabriel's uh, Innsbruck simulation, all of them are available for free online. Um, of course, only for research purposes, not for commercial purposes. Um, and if you are interested in working on that and sh or sharing your data, your ideas with that, please approach us and we can uh, look for uh, ways to, uh, to uh, connect research here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alistair, for your great presentation. It was an interesting presentation, an interesting topic. I see like virtual applauses for you here. So with that, with our presentation, having and that we are now open for uh, questions. If you have any questions, please feel free to raise your hand or unmute yourself or write down your question in the chat section. Maybe in the meantime, I just say uh, that I should, or I should say hello from Lisa. She is uh, not able to present to you today. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe next time in Washington or somewhere else. Um, but she is also quite happy that you invited us to present the research today. Pleasure, thank you for presenting today. No questions so far. Uh, hi, maybe I can uh, ask my friend Alistair for a short comment. Uh, about the R square values that uh, we saw, I think it was slide 34 or 35. Although you said in the last, uh, in one of your last comments that you expect to improve the methodology. Uh, do you have an explanation on uh, why those R values are relatively low as uh, ones we have seen uh, earlier in the literature or maybe with uh, working with uh, real data? Thank you. Uh, I think you're referring to this slide here because I have R squares, R square values on this slide and then on the PNORMA data as well. Okay. So in this exercise here, we just use the data set as we published it on, you know, on the UTD data set. So it's just an entire city with a lot of chaos. And the only thing that we discovered here was the nighttime. So we just said, okay, look from I think six o'clock in the morning to I think nine o'clock in the afternoon, and we just take all the data that we have without any substantial data filtering um, taking, taking place. Um, so there's a lot of chaos. Also, we did not really use network partitioning to somewhat try to find better uh, okay. mm -hmm. sizable areas. And so I think if you really go to the data sets that are nice, so which is the Innsbruck data set or the Pinoma data set, uh, I would consider given the complexity of what we have in Athens, Having a simple model with an R degree of 0.3 is already quite nice. Yeah, I, I think um, what you said for the network topology could actually enhance this uh, uh, measurement a lot. But uh, yeah, it, it makes sense. Yeah, thank you, Alistair. 
and we're looking forward for the improved uh, data set uh, from Athens that you're producing at the moment. Yeah, thank you, thank you. We are uh, we are working on it quite intensively. We hope we can uh, publish it in the next uh, months. Let's see. We, we, we found some really interesting <laughs> stuff. So yeah, yeah we as we well. We as well. Excited. Great, great. Very exciting months to come. <laughs> So I don't see any questions in the chat box. I think your presentation was clear enough. So there are no questions on any parts of it. And I think with all that said, we can finish our webinar today. Thank you again, Elsa and Gabriel for being with us today and presenting your research. Hope we can have you later again with new results and new topics. Thank you again, everyone, for joining us. Have a wonderful rest of your day or night, wherever you are. <laughs> Thank you very much. Have a great, have a great day. Thank you. you, too. you too. Bye -bye. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.